Now, Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and today we are going to be talking uh, about concerns that businesses have on two different fronts. On the uh, first uh, half, we're going to talk to Scott Wolf, who's sitting here with me from Grossmart, Rhode Island, about the historic tax credit program. But uh, later on the show, we're also going to talk about health insurance rate increases that are looming with Stephen Boyle from the Cranston Chamber and Mark Gray from the Providence Plan. But I want to start off here with Scott. And Scott, thanks for being here. Pleasure to be here, Tim. And you know, you know the Statehouse pretty well, so you understand yep. how all these things go. And uh, you caught my attention when Grossmart was uh, disappointed, your organization, and your allies that the new state budget didn't include uh, 52 million dollars in additional state tax credits to subsidize the redevelopment of historic buildings the historic tax credit program much discussed why such a big concern to all of you well we think that the historic tax credit program has been the single best economic development and neighborhood revitalization tool the state has seen in decades so we think it's a major missed opportunity and the funding was was from bond bonds that already were authorized to be funded so it wouldn't require a new commitment uh, uh, by the state it was for a commitment that had been made a number of years ago and we just think that a number of the projects that are on the waiting list uh, for the historic tax credit because it's so popular may decide not to go forward as a result of the uncertainty that's been created by the suspension of funding so we, we think that it and we also think because of that suspension that it contributes to a sense that Rhode Island isn't such a great place to do business, although I know there are other steps that were, were taken to address that issue in this session of the General Assembly. Talk about the commitment already being made, and uh, we, uh, we've been discussing this uh, outside of this uh, studio, but the, did they borrow the money for the additional $52 million back in 08 when they did the bond deal they on the historic tax well, credits? Well, they authorized the borrowing for but it. But we haven't actually borrowed it yet, right? That's correct. It's, it's part of a, a two hundred and almost $300 million uh, authorization that the, the General Assembly made in 2008 when it suspended the program the last time, but allowed funding to continue for projects that were already underway. Uh, and so that bond authorization was primarily for those projects that were already underway. Some of them have fallen by the wayside, so there is more money available than was expected for new projects. So if, if, if more of those projects had gone to completion, the bond authorization probably would have been used up funding those because it wasn't. There's money left Correct. in what they said they were willing to allocate. And you're saying, OK, well, now use that money for new projects instead of. Right. And there was some technical, th there was some of that money uh, was, was held in reserve. Uh, there gotcha. was 200 and about 300 that was uh, was going to be used for tax credits, and then another 50 or so that was held in reserve. Gotcha. All right. I don't want to lose yeah. people on the bond yeah. details because I can, <laughs> I can yeah. see them all switching. Don't turn it off yet. Well. Yeah, but, but I guess the other point I just <laughs> want to make quickly is I don't think that this bond authorization can be used for other purposes. So it's not as if this can be shifted to some other program. So when I asked Speaker Mattiello about this decision, why it's in the, uh, in, why it wasn't in the budget, because Governor Chafee did propose his funding, but the, the lawmakers didn't go along. The Speaker told me, quote, the historic tax credit, pro credit program is going to continue, but we're taking a one-year break from funding it. Uh, so what's the problem with that? It's, it's coming back. He's saying it sounds like they agree with you. They just say, not this year. We don't have the money this year, but next year we'll do it. Well, I, unfortunately, I, I think suspending it for a year is sending a bad signal to business people and investors about the reliability of doing business and making investments in Rhode Island. And uh, I th a developer uh, looks at, at projects like this with a long lead time, with a long time horizon. These projects can take three or four years to complete. And so if they feel as though they can't look into the future with any predictability, they will go to Connecticut or Massachusetts, which have robust historic tax credit programs, or to Maine, which also has one, or they'll, they'll plow up green fields instead of investing in, in historic uh, buildings and contribute to sprawl and to a loss of farmland and forest land. So, there's a number of negative consequences from this, uh, potentially. We hope that the, the speaker uh, and other leadership will fast track uh, reinstatement of the funding for the historic tax credit early in the next session. We realize they haven't ended the program per se. We, we acknowledge that and we were glad at least that that didn't happen. But it, it, 
may undermine the program if there isn't because, fast corrective action because taken. Because the point being that there is, uh, there is more demand out there. For, there are projects that developers claim they, they move forward on. 27. 27, 27 that are on a waiting list uh, based on the last statistics we saw from the Division of Taxation. How big are those projects though? Well, they, some of them are quite big, some of them are relatively small. Uh, they, they will range from uh, a million or two million dollar project to twenty or thirty million in a, in a few cases. And these projects produce both short-term and long-term jobs. Construction jobs, then they produce jobs uh, uh, for commercial activity that's occurring in, in those places. Uh, they contribute to an increase in public safety because a lot of these buildings prior to rehab are targets for vandalism and for arson. Uh, so there are multiple benefits to this program and I think it's, it's demonstrated it over the last decade. What about the argument this is government subsidies for, for real estate developers, sometimes deep-pocketed real estate developers. Why should Rhode Island taxpayers have to effectively uh, contribute to these projects? I mean, why can't the free market just do the projects if they're good projects? Well, there have been a number of subsidies over the years that have favored development out in the suburbs. And this is a way to balance the playing field. It's not a way to tilt the playing field in favor of uh, urban redevelopment, but it's a, it's a way to make urban redevelopment uh, feasible. Uh, and a lot of, and it's also playing to one of our strengths. Rhode Island has a larger collection of historic buildings uh, than any, uh, per, per square mile, than any other state in America. Uh, we don't have a lot of open, land that, uh, that at least we want to develop. So let's, let's play to a strength. Let's play to an area where we can compete with any state in the country. We keep, we keep being reminded about how we're ranked near the bottom on certain in indexes. On this, on this um, metric, we're right at the top. Now before we go to a break, is this, are these programs common? Are, they, are there most states have historic? More than 30 states have state historic tax credit. What program. about our neighbors though? In, in uh, Massachusetts has a significant historic tax credit program. They spend about 60 million a year on it. Uh, Connecticut has a state historic tax credit program with a roughly comparable uh, amounts uh, allocated to it per year. Maine has a so-called uncapped program. There's no, no direct cap on the amount that they spend in a given year. So those are all robust programs. New York State has a program. Uh, uh, Virginia has a very robust program. So all to, over you find yeah. it, yeah. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk more with Scott Wolf about uh, some of the things he does like that's in the new state budget. And then later in the show, we're going to talk about some concerns businesses have about rising health insurance costs coming next year. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and later on in the show, we're going to be hearing about uh, the looming health insurance rate hikes coming next year for businesses and some concerns uh, being expressed about that. But right now, I'm joined by Grow Smart Rhode Island's Scott Wolf, and we're talking about some of the changes being made in the new state budget. And we talked in the first segment about some of your concerns, but I know right. there are things Grow Smart's happy about in there. Tell me about some of what you think is positive in this budget. Yeah, I'd be happy to. There are quite a few things that we're, we're happy about. Uh, more investments in transit, both uh, in RIPTA and in developing uh, new transit hubs to uh, create a more integrated, efficient uh, transportation system uh, in and out of Providence especially. We're very pleased about that. Then, now, the transit hubs is a bond issue that's being proposed, so that isn't a fait accompli, but at least the voters are going to have a chance to weigh in on that. There's also a bond issue to provide funding for redevelopment of contaminated sites, environmentally contaminated sites known as brownfields. Those tend to be located in our urban areas and are a major barrier to having our cities uh, achieve their full potential. So we're really glad that that's at least something the voters can vote on, along with farmland protection, funding for farmland protection and farmland acquisition. Uh, also, the uh, green light being given to the South Station redevelopment project for the URI Rick uh, Nursing Center and Brown University offices is another positive investment in the state's future. Uh, so there, there, are a number, there are a number of good, uh, tangible uh, initiatives that, and so, and overall, I think uh, Speaker Mattiello is is showing a lot of leadership and uh, and moving the state in the right direction. I just, I just wish uh, on the historic tax credit that that he had uh, taken a different course. But hopefully, uh, he'll he'll realize that. Uh, that's something that needs to be done early in the next session. One thing that wasn't in the budget, uh, this request for potentially millions of dollars to rehab the, the old so-called Superman building, downtown Providence, the old bank building there. Uh, what, uh, uh, not necessarily just on the narrow question of the tax money, but what does, does Grossmart have a sense of what should happen? I mean, should we knock it down? Should it be apartments? I mean, what do you guys think should happen? Well, oh, I don't think building? we should knock it down. I mean, it's a great iconic structure. It's, uh, it's a, a lot of the brand of Providence, Rhode Island. 
uh, and it's in a critical location wh where we're trying to actually enliven the city with the re re remaking of Kennedy Plaza. So, uh, uh, as some somebody else once said recently, it's like it's like a missing missing uh, front tooth for us if, if 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 nothing happens there. So we think it is important that it be redeveloped, and we think the idea of primarily residential makes a lot of sense. The, the vacancy rate for apartments in and around downtown Providence is virtually nil. Uh, the, the, there, there is a demand, there is an unmet demand for more downtown apartment living. But there is the cost issue, and we have been part of a coalition that backed the state historic tax credit reinstatement with a $5 million cap per project. Which of course not nearly enough for the for Superman, the Superman building. building. So how, so it's a little bit dicey for us to go to Mayor Avedesian in Warwick, for example, and say Pontiac Mills or the Elizabeth Mill, which, which if you didn't have a cap might, might command as much money as the Superman building is looking for. You can only get five million, but we're all for 39 million for the Superman building in downtown Providence. Now, you can make the case that Providence's future is especially critical to the future of the state and that maybe there needs to be some special attention made there. But do we, do we approve almost eight times as much funding yeah. for that as, as we're allowing for other historic buildings? Of no the, consensus there, it sounds like. It's, it's, a, cha it's a challenge, yeah. yeah. I'd certainly like to see some funding for it and I'd like to see a reuse and I think they, the people who are owning the building and, and planning for its redevelopment have the right general idea about its reuse. We're winding down on time here, but I wanted to ask you a question more on my other beat in politics, but you worked for Governor Bruce, former Governor yeah, I've been, Bruce I've been on, I've been on that track uh, in, the late in the past. I know you have as well. <laughs> Big election this year, his name comes a lot, mostly from the Democrats, about you know what they look, when they look for gubernatorial leadership, what they want to be like. Y you work for the guy. What, what do you think the lessons are from Sunland's era, especially now that he's being discussed so much? What do you think he showed, and why was he effective in the times that he was? Well, he showed a lot of resiliency. He had a lot of real tough situations to deal with, especially the collapse of the credit unions. Uh, he had a can-do attitude. Uh, he also had a belief that government could work uh, in, co in conjunction with the private sector. He was a, he was a big believer in private-public partnerships for things like the Rhode Island Convention Center and the, and the rebuilding of the state airport. Uh, so, and he was not afraid to, believe it or not, he was not afraid to listen to other people. There was a sense... Not some the sense people, of him you get I now, know, but, but no, but he, he would actually, he would actually liked good dialogue about issues and he liked good input and I think he surrounded himself generally, I'm leaving myself aside, with a lot of talented uh, people who had, didn't have a, a personal axe to grind but had a real commitment to public service. So uh, he was an excellent governor. Uh, not perfect, but an excellent governor and I think a good role model for all the, the people uh, who are seeking the office today. All right, a little history lesson there from Scott Wolf. <laughs> Scott, thank you for being here with me. Stick with us on the show because up next we're going to have Stephen Boyle from the Cranston Chamber of Commerce and Mark Gray from the Providence Plan talking about the health insurance rate hikes that are being requested and why that's not good, they think, for small businesses. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and we're not talking about Buddy Cianci. We're the only program in town maybe that didn't do that somewhat this week, but I'm pleased to be joined by Mark Gray, Healthcare Coordinator at the Providence Plan, and Stephen Boyle, President of the Greater Cranston Chamber of Commerce. Thank you both for being here. I might have Thank said you. Providence earlier. I apologize if I did. Nope, I that's fine. <laughs> Greater Cranston Chamber of Commerce. We all know Lori White up in Providence, but yep. you guys got my attention recently because you're both part of the Health Insurance Small Employer Task Force, which uh, I believe the Providence Plan coordinates, right? Yes. Mark? So uh, earlier this month, the task force sent out a release uh, expressing concern, alarm about these looming rate increases. We're, we kind of know the story and it happens a lot coming next year. But Mark, first, before we talk about the concern, just give me a sense, what, what do those filings show? What are, what are these small businesses facing next year? So very simply, um, the insurance carriers every year, they file with the health insurance commissioner their proposed rates for the coming year. Uh, this year in the small business, the small group market, which is for businesses that have 50 or fewer employees, um, we're looking at increases that have been requested from Blue Cross on the order of 6 to 8 percent over the current base rate, um, from United 16 percent up from the current base rate, uh, and Tufts has requested around 5 percent increase from the current base rate. Uh, one encouraging thing is that Neighborhood Health Plan, which is entering the small group market for the first time, actually filed a rate that is lower than their currently approved base rate um, by, I believe, about 6 percent. Um, 
it's remarkable, you know, that it's lower. It's this, you don't really see this ever. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's creating, it's very interesting. But because they're new to the market, a lot of business owners are concerned that the plans that they already have looks like the rates are going to go up. Especially with the dominance of Blue Cross, so I know United's made inroads and yeah. Tufts has too. So, Stephen, what's the reaction to this possibility from uh, your members of the chamber and the other folks in the task force? Well, I, I, you know, I've testified over the last few years, and I'm also the co-chair to the uh, Health Insurance Commissioner with HIAC, and, uh, you know, it's very serious. What's HIAC uh, for the people? HIAC is the Health Insurance Advisory Council um, to Dr. Hitner. And uh, the concern is, uh, there's a great concern in the small business community uh, going up. It's, it's unsustainable. We've been saying this for years. I always testify saying it's healthcare Groundhog Day. We go back in, the rates go back up. We change the plans from what they were. Uh, so obviously it's, it's, it's a major concern in the small business and, and larger businesses too because they're, they're going to face a healthy increase as well. So uh, Mark, you, you know, you, part of the, the ask there was to come and testify before, which I believe that testimony has happened now yes. uh, in front of the task force. Uh, with the health insurance commissioner, but what uh, what what is the request? Is it drop them all to zero? Is it just tweak them a little bit? You know what's going because yeah. of course they claim that they need this money. Yeah, well, many many of the of the folks who spoke at the public input meeting with the commissioner last week, they they did ask for zero increase. Um, they're looking at their bottom lines. They're looking at their budgets, and many of them uh, had a lot to say about how the rising cost of healthcare is impacting their ability to hire. They want to bring in new employees. They find it very difficult. They have to revisit whether or not they can even offer insurance again this year as they see the rates go up. So many of them did ask for, for uh, hold the line on the rates. Now, the health insurance commissioner is in a really difficult position, and she's to be commended. Uh, she has to this balance. Dr. Hittner. Dr. Kathleen, Kathleen Hittner. Hittner, yes. She has to balance the needs of consumers, but also the needs of the health insurance company. She, her office exists to protect their solvency as well. So it's very difficult. Um, the, the health insurance rates going up in and of themselves is sort of a symptom of the larger problem in the healthcare system with costs at the point of delivery and, and, and other problems with the system. So it is just one piece of it. But for the small business owner who's just trying to make payroll, just trying to stay in business, you know, they see these costs going up. They don't have a lot of other expenses that, that increase 8% or 16%. Yeah. Yeah, far below, far above year. inflation. I, yeah. Yeah, I think one of the things that Mark points out with that, what was staggering in the testimony is the percentage of health care in their overall cost. Some of the people who testify are saying that health care exceeds the raw material cost of their business. So you, you've got an outside cost that's greater than the core cost for, an exa for a business. Uh, uh, Jeff Grove from uh, Pilgrim Screw is an example where that exceeds his raw materials cost, which is staggering when you think about it. Uh, you know, that's a major expense, and you want to have your you want to have your employees covered. You want to be able to do that. But he's right, and one of the things that we find out from being on the task force and with HIAC is there's a lot of balancing that has to go on with these rates. Let me ask you, Steve. How you know you, you I think you hinted at the answer there, but. When you talk to chamber members, when you talk to other small businesses, how high does health insurance rank right now in their list of concerns? Of course, you know, demand for their products is right. a concern and everything, but where right. is it? How often does it come up? Oh, I think it's, the, it, it's really the top priority uh, that they face. I mean, obviously, the, the, the general economy and selling and how they market their products, but it's, it's a bottom line cost that's staggering, and it's, and it's constantly... I hear from members that it's an unsustainable situation, and that and that's the problem. They're saying, you know, we can we can afford this, but we can't afford this. Now it's going from one company came in to see me and said it's going from sixteen thousand to twenty four thousand, you know, and we we just can't do it. We don't. They don't know where they're going to get the money from. They're not sure what they're going to do. They want to remain competitive. They want to be able to offer health insurance. So I think it's it, it's a major concern from everybody that I talk to anyway. There's been some talk among the health wonks out there that that you know they're starting to bend the cost curve, mm -hmm. keep the the cost from going up as right. much. Do you hear any sense in these conversations that it's, there's any sense it's getting better well, among folks or is it, do they just feel like it's the same thing year after year and they haven't seen much relief? No, I think what you're seeing is you're seeing the trend head that way and we've, we've had this discussion quite a bit and we've had it in the late, uh, not this last rate hearing but the hearing before, is that there are, there are changes. Lifespan is working with Blue Cross, they're doing cost containment situations, they have a Blue Cross has done a uh, situation with coastal uh, patient centered medical homes. They're trying to contain these costs into, uh, uh, by, by implementing new ways to get paid, uh, going more towards global payment situation than a fee for service type situation. So you see that. But one of the things that we always try to impress, and when they came there with the hospitals, is it's the sense of urgency that the business community is not seeing. We're saying, okay, we're doing this. 
we're going down, we're driving this, we, yeah, okay, we understand that, but we need relief right now. And that's what the business community is saying. You can't wait 15 We can't years. wait. Right. <laughs> we yeah. can't wait. Mark, you're, uh, you're, you're a smart guy. I know you follow this stuff. I mean, how much can uh, the task force, you know, a group in Little Rhode Island really do when this is a massive national problem of higher health care costs? You know, what's the, you know, what was the hope when it was founded? What, what's sort of the driving force behind it when you're up against yeah. that? Yeah, I think that the main priority is to really inform and engage the small business community and the small employer community. Um, I say business, but I really want to stress that we include nonprofits as well, um, any employer. And, and we want to inform them to be able to better participate in the debate and to better be able to articulate you know, their experience. We want to engage them in things like the public input process. Uh, and and I, I do believe that the more we have consumers and purchasers of health insurance participate in some of some of these debates and ask and answer some of these questions um, you're going to that's going to have an impact that's going to move things in the right direction you talk about Rhode Island specifically yes we're just little roadie but um, there's a lot that can be done especially in light of some of the changes that the Affordable Care Act has brought about that states can innovate um, and and you know the small business community here is really clamoring for that innovation from from everybody who's involved in healthcare in the state right now. You mentioned the Affordable Care Act that actually segues into my next question, which is Health Source RI, the state's Obamacare marketplace. We've had Christy Ferguson on the show, the head of the head of Health Source RI, and she talks a lot, Stephen, about uh, making a push for small employers to sign mm -hmm. up to use that portal. She thinks it can help and everything. Right. I'm just curious, is, that, is she getting any traction out there? What are you hearing? Are people open to it? It's a oh, change, and as you say, people are very nervous about making big changes in this area. They are, but I, again, if you go back, I, I, I'm a very big advocate. We've been big advocates. We set up a hotline at the chamber so people could call in uh, to do that. I think the small business community really needs to take a look at this. I, I don't think, I think some of the apprehension in the past is, you know, you, as you know, there's been a lot of press about what it is, what it isn't, everything else like that, but, but when we see people sign up for this, their costs are going down. Uh, we work with businesses and, and like they said, Merico, Phil Papujan, who uh, in Merico and West Warwick, he offered it to his employees. Those costs have gone down. They've picked plans that fit their situations rather than this one fits all. Uh, business community has always said, we don't, we don't like picking one plan. Well now, the state of Rhode Island is really the only state that I know of that's offering employee choice. So now these employees now have the opportunity to pick a health care plan that fits what they want to do. The business community can also stabilize their bottom line cost by saying, I'm going to fund this. We're going to pick this baseline plan and then we're going to offer other plans to the insurance company. So they can actually stabilize their bottom line look in this. I advocate that everybody really needs to take a look at it. All right, we're out of time, but I want to thank Mark Gray, Stephen Boyle, and earlier thank in the you. show, Scott Wolf for joining me this week on Executive Suite. Be sure to tune in next week when we'll be switching it up and talking about beer with <laughs> Nick, uh, Nick Garrison. Make sure we're here for that, right? He's the founder of Foolproof Brewing up in Pawtucket. We're going to talk about how their company is going a few years in. If you missed any of this show or any other episode of Executive Suite, you can catch all of those on our website wpri.com and I'll be back here next week. I'll see you then on Executive Suite. Thanks to you.